We will start the symposium with a keynote speaker who is perfect for this topic of the future. She comes from, she's a partner at UN Studio, which is a very future-oriented international architecture practice. It was founded by Ben van Berkel, big name in architecture. And among its work fields, UN Studio has a team working with, together with external partners on scenarios that help us predict how technology, social, political, and economic factors will affect the built environment. So these are exactly the questions that we seek answers to today in the symposium. So please welcome her on stage, our keynote speaker, Astrid Pieber. Welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me and announcing it. Like there are big topics and I'm going to talk about future proofing design from a UN Studio perspective. So I'm telling you in the forefront, you will not see a brick building in my presentation and I will focus on um, yeah, how we approach design, how we see the, the bigger picture and bigger topics because what was announced, like the question, which challenges are we going to face? It's not a question to architects. Uh, I mean, we can respond and we should respond by doing our best on that question, but it's a more general question to the wider group of people going to use buildings in the future and uh, going to develop buildings and what um, yeah, we are going forward. You might hear the Austrian accent in my English. It's true, I'm Austrian born 20 years ago. I, I left Austria because in the 90s, the Netherlands were really booming. And I left uh, Austria for three reasons, um, or I joined the Netherlands for three reasons. One, that in the Netherlands, there's a uh, large thinking about urban planning and visionary thinking of how to um, yeah, plan your landscape so, so to create your own land. The second was Van Berkel and Boss at that time, which were the forerunners for me in digital technology. Like they were the first ones in Europe that could uh, design things digitally, but also build them. And that's what I think in architecture is very important, that it's not just about design, but also the implementation of your design. And thirdly, I think the entrepreneurial spirit of the Netherlands makes things possible there um, that are maybe not that easy achievable somewhere else. And I have to say, I, I was thinking this morning about it on my flight to Vienna, and I thought, oh yeah, the three things, they are still there, and they are still in the work of UN Studio, and that's actually what, what gives all of us, and we're 250 at the moment, uh, the drive to, to continue, continuously work on, on those challenges. So I'm sparing you our architectural projects, but just to... Uh, name three key projects in the beginning, and I'm not naming them for the architecture or how they, they, they look like, but they have been really milestones in our processes. For example, the Erasmus Bridge in Rotterdam was uh, 3D developed, very digitally very complicated in AutoCAD, all unfoldable surfaces. It had to be produced in a shipyard, it was transported to the site, and at that time this, this was really new in the, in the construction process and made it also possible that it could be there. And we celebrated 20 years of Erasmus Bridge, and basically it showed also how much development of the city of Rotterdam it initiated. And I think that's what makes architects in the end proud, that things are getting used in a good way, that they transform over time and uh, they help to develop the city. The Mercedes-Benz Museum in, in Stuttgart in the middle was another key milestone because it was the first project that we fully developed in, in BIM together with our full consultant team. We were working in one 3D model, so it was driving our digital processes in the studio uh, enormously fast because it had to be finished within four years between competition and opening. And then in the opposite, like we had a 20-year project, the master plan in Arnhem, like the project why I came to the Netherlands, basically, and came to the studio, that was where the last part was only completed 20 years later. And we, all those years, we were trying to develop the twist in concrete. How could it be built? How could it be calculated? I don't know, 20 engineers were calculating it. In the end, it got built in a shipbuilding method in steel. And I, I think that shows a little bit also the flexibility that you as an architect ha has, have to have, because when you design a project, 
it's, it has to be future-proof. So the, the future has to be now. And during the process, the design has to um, comply with the needs of the future, basically. So what we set up and was mentioned in the introduction was a series of, of units in our studio that are dealing with research that we find relevant for yeah, a wide range of projects. They're connected to, to digital technology, but also to materials. They're connected to uh, organizational platforms. And we, we think it's important because the design times that we have for projects get shorter and shorter. So four weeks for a concept design is quite normal nowadays. And we want to be upfront and still innovative and not uh, like just follow the, 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 the questions from a client. So what these tools make is to help us make design the architecture fit to the needs of the users, but also implement the design. But we also have sort of forecasting units. Those are these work fields that deal with topics like uh, the new campus, super living, but also work is a one important one, and, and mobility. And those are linking basically with, with our tools. And we have issued this book last year about our tools because, and it, it's not a recipe, but those were developed um, answering a question of a project. So it's for us very important that it's responsive. It's not, uh, if, you, if you want to think about the future, you have to come with solutions that are not standard, not off the shelf. And you have to do that in the most effective uh, manner. So if we think of two trends that we uh, think are determining the work, our future work at the moment, one of them is data. And it has always been data, but I mean, we are quite comfortable, each of us, to use data for analysis, like especially in urban planning. Here we analyzed Amsterdam and the movements and mobility patterns in Amsterdam. I think there's enormous amount of this information, and it helps us and city planners to to come to conclusions. But the future might be in using data in a more on-demand way, so that you can uh, actively control traffic, monitor, deroute. And it, it's starting to happen with different apps and different flows. But this is actually bringing such a potential forward that, that you see that planning and technology become more, or have to become more and more integrated to steer that. And we have um, looking at this for have been looking at this for a long time. We looked basically at the, I mean, the physical environment we call as the hard environment of architecture. But there is also the the soft, like what people do inside, but also what technology is doing. Yeah, we we all have changed since the internet how we are doing things, and cities are changing because of technology. So we have set up this in order to to get rid of this misalignment, because we see people driving their, their Teslas, using their gadgets, being on the top-notch technology, but just our workspaces, for example, are not even um, that advanced for us. So I, I think there is a mismatch, and Sense really works at this aligning these uh, two ideas with each other, but not to like other sensory adaptable systems to control things, but to make the human environment more human, or so that you can steer what you would like to, to do with it. And to explain that a bit better, it's maybe this, this research pot that we did for the Salone di Mobile last year. It's a sort of a reset pot. You basically sh should be able to de-stress there. So it's sensors that measure your heartbeat and give you lifetime feedback and change basically by a light and uh, um, rhythm that you can calm down. So, and this feedback loop basically was used uh, with uh, lots of people and we were testing it and continuously testing it, how it can impact to, yeah, uh, create a calmer environment because many people are getting stressed from work in the work floor. So we have been further developing this idea of this experimental furniture basically to something that could be uh, used in, in, in the work floor by different, uh, different companies. If we talk 
and health, I think that was the example that I wanted to bring, we see as a strong second trend. And then if we think of data and health, it's really our cities where we see most changes happening. And where basically it's not just how people move, because we have worked on uh, airports, we've worked on the Arnhem station, on, on different transport projects, but it's also how our goods are moving, like especially in Amsterdam, you, you see that a lot because the city is very overcrowded, which means that big trucks are not, or it's not so good that they are serving the inner city. So you see electric buses, other means of, of things coming up, of mobility, that essentially change how the programming of the, the city looks like. And we have looked at, um, yeah, for example, in Doha, on the metro network, on all the lines. But lately, we are having work for two European cities, and we are investigating, for example, what the cable car system can contribute to the, to the public transport. So one of, one of the cities we are doing that is, is Gothenburg, and that was a winning competition. And it's, it's quite important for their public transport network to have that. It's also, of course, cheaper than a metro, but also more personal than a metro system. Because you look at the city, it's a more active journey. And that's probably why it has been the winning proposal, because it really interacts with, with the city. It makes the journey more interesting. And the stations are basically like service stations on a city level, but also on a neighborhood level and on a, on a building level. So. It's really about the end user, and you see that uh, ideas of transport are changing because of that. But let me go back to the study that we did for, for Amsterdam. It was basically for the, for the ring road in Amsterdam that is having most of the times too much traffic, and it's increasing because yeah, the city is growing and higher demand. So we looked at, at 13 hubs around this ring road, basically where there is strong connection to public transport, like the South Us is one of the biggest transport connection points. But we also looked at the West, uh, Sloterdijk, Lelilan, these areas to see what is the potential of, the, of these uh, hubs and how can, can the city change through looking at infrastructure differently. So of course, the highway is a problem because, I mean, it would need to expand. You don't want that in a city like Amsterdam to expand it. So there are technologies like the zipper or the, in the far future, the LED roads, so that you can really stream the, the traffic where it needs to go. But what we basically suggested is, is a hub. And this hub is a place to to transfer from the car to your e-bike or your bike or public transport, but also where you can uh, load your car with electricity, where you can charge it, where you can also pick up your parcel, where you can uh, get your groceries th that you have ordered before. So it really, the idea was to keep the traffic out of the inner center, but also by changing basically the highway structure to create a better living along those hubs and densify the area instead of uh, going, going wider. In a way, a city will always be as good as the quality of the construction is. So where we come to the scale of architecture, I think it's a lot about how we do things and what we suggest in our designs. So last year, we had um, and that's a truffle slicer for Alessi that we released last year at the same time that we completed our largest project to date, which is a project we have been working on since 2008 in, in China. And it's extremely different scales, but it stands, both stand for a big influence on our work in the, in the last decade. One is the, the product design, and the other one are these large, fast-paced Asian projects that in a way follow a similar method, because all the components of the buildings and the truffle slicer are 3D um, developed. They are prepared and then assembled manually, like the truffle slicer. And if you see this at the height of 250 meter with the bamboo scaffolding, if you saw the construction site, it, it's also this mix of high tech and, and low tech coexisting with each other. 
And that's maybe also the, the beauty about it. Um, and you see that actually construction is on its way to become more sustainable, but, but still circular planning yeah, is in its footsteps, I guess. We, we still have a long way to go. And also the BIM processes often don't make it to the building site on many projects. As architects, we can all have it figured out, but it might not end up in the construction site. So, and we know we cannot start with everything. But when we started on this project, we were really intrigued by this idea to create a sustainable 24-7 location in a new part of, of this large Chinese town. And it's a block that measures 100 by 150 meter. And it's truly mixed use with a podium, of, with a commercial podium, um, office in both towers, then hotel and serviced apartments and residential on, on top. And key for us was to create an organization where these programs uh, are very clear differentiated with clear entrances to each program, but also with voids and courtyards that create visual connection between those. So that's, for example, a study model of the, of the central void. And this is then inside the mall that was opened uh, last year. And it's daylit and it's naturally ventilated, which made it one of the yeah, platinum gold malls in, in China, which, which is, sounds normal to us, but there it's quite, quite an achievement. And I think for us it was important that there is continuity in the mall, but there's also continuity between the, the interior spaces and the towers, that you really perceive a continuous experience of, of where you are in this mixed-use development. And this idea of, of energy that of course, is in every of our projects, how we use energy with, with in a way how we use the building and design for it, but also um, how it can harvest energy is something that we have been looking into all our facade studies, basically. It has been something that interested us from yeah, 10 years back. We started with a FP7 project construct PV, about PV cells and how they could look more attractive for retrofitting facades, which is a big topic on the, on the European market, of course, because um, and we experimented with, with a large consortium, basically in how frit on the glass in combination with the cells, how it could look attractive, be transparent, translucent, but also um, generate enough energy. And lately, we have been further developing that project into something that we call solar brick, and that's now in, in the piloting uh, phase, which is a project that is based on this combination of, of glass and frit and solar cells. Um, that research happened in one of these very long trajectories. In parallel, we had a project for a client in Korea. It was a competition 2012, and the client, Hanwa, they own a company producing solar cells, Q-cells, and that's their headquarter. And originally, their headquarter was just the ordinary 70s uh, office building, and they didn't want to tear it down, but upgrade the facade. So what we developed for them was basically a sort of responsive facade, where we develop a, a family of facade modules that include solar cells, but also include uh, LED cells on certain parts, depending on yeah, where you can harvest most sunlight and on optimizing it and creating this link also with, with the activities on the inside. This is currently under construction and finishes hopefully next year, but it takes some time because the client decided to stay in, in the building during the whole process, and it's just moving from the lowest level upwards and transforming three floors at, at at the time, which, which is also very interesting and in a way uh, a different approach, and architects have to, to be patient. This is going back to the, the project in China. I, I'm sorry I'm showing so many images of that, but it's a little bit on my heart. And this idea of the, of the skin and the 
like these are just a few different types of aluminum shingles. They are positioned differently in different distances, and yeah, they they cover the whole double curved surface of of the envelope. But they also cover the underside of the podium, and they are shiny. They are reflective. They really bring the yeah the the greenery in. They bring they make a connection to the neighborhood, um, and put the urban context in. And that's an aspect that architecture yeah, sh should enhance, like the link to the context and uh, cr cr also linking, going, going beyond just building a, being a building and immersing with the, with the user, but also like w what I discussed before, like having this continuity with the, with the towers, this feeling that you are underneath two towers that are 250 meters, you know where you are, this point of orientation in the city, to really convey that in a, in a project was very important for us. Again, lots of digital tools to get this facade uh, built, basically. We worked with Katia to develop it because two contractors built the facades on both towers in parallel. So the, the 3D material had to be um, really accurate and it was produced locally after 10 mock-ups and yeah, the, the building quality actually got better every year and I, I think we are very happy with the effect that it had. So I think we have been learning from, from China but also I, th I think the whole process was very important for the whole team learning from each other. Like we had in our team 115 architects working on all different design phases and tasks within the, the, the building on the exterior but also on the, the interior. And we had a, probably together with the client and with all the experts a team of 1,000 people working on it um, in total. So it's, it's quite amazing you're not doing it by yourself. It's really a team that brings these ideas together about um, yeah, sustainability, but also the image. I think for the client, this really helped them to, to create something future-proof in the city of Hangzhou, because they own it, they operate it themselves, and they, yeah, I think they had already the, like for them, it's economic future-proof, because that showed the, the first year in a way as well, which is also important for our work, because um, these are the, different successes that we can help clients to achieve, but it's also important that it becomes a very good urban space in this, in this new neighborhood of, of Hangzhou. And yeah, actually that brings me a bit um, to the end of my short talk. And I think it, it's really about also competitions that challenge us, like the, the brick award, but it, it's also about collaboration with different parties and understanding what future proof means uh, for everyone so that you can design towards that. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you.